Hello and welcome. I'm Jeunesse Gastonguet, VP at Clarius. We're thrilled to see so many of you join us here today for the live webinar, Ultrasound for Accurate MSK Injections and Interventions, Part 2, The Knee. You're among 2,900 clinicians who registered for today's popular event. In a moment, we'll be welcoming back the fabulous Dr. Alan Hirohara. Board certified in orthopedic surgery and sports medicine, Dr. Hirohara will teach us expert ultrasound techniques to accurately guide a variety of knee injections for optimal visualization of anatomy and your needle. Today's webinar is the second in a new series of cadaver webinars. Dr. Hirohara is helping us to fast track our ultrasound learning curve for guiding accurate MSK injections by using cadaver segments to demonstrate a wide variety of pain injections. Our last webinar focused on the shoulder, and today's focus is the knee. Please use the Q&A icon at any time during today's session to ask questions, which we'll address in a live session following the presentation. Let me now introduce you to your host for today's webinar. Dr. Frankel is trained in emergency medicine in California. A passionate POCUS educator, Dr. Frankel has been using point of care ultrasound his entire career. He practices in a busy academic teaching hospital in Vancouver as an emergency physician and serves as chairman of our medical advisory board. Join me in welcoming Dr. Frankel. Hi, Janez. Thanks. It's good to be here today. And another great topic that I'm excited to talk about. Uh, one that's also close and dear to my heart is using ultrasound, particularly in various knee injections. Um, to set the stage for today's discussion with Dr. Hirohara, uh, we did a bit of a literature review and updated some of our knowledge. The first paper I wanted to review was a large systematic review that covered um, a total of 1,430 patients um, that was almost 1,500 knees. And it compared ultrasound guided injections to blind injections across all of the different studies. And without surprise, if you've been following some of our other webinars, it's not really surprising to see that in every study where they looked, ultrasound proved to be more accurate compared with blind injections in the knee um, across the board. To make it more relevant to today's discussion, there was another paper that focuses in particularly on Pez and Sirinus Versa injections. And this was a randomized clinical tr trial that used steroid injections in ultrasound guidance fashion versus blind injections in the Pez and Sirinus Versa. And interestingly, using a visual analog scale, at one week, there was no significant difference. But following the patients out to four weeks, there was a significant difference between the ultrasound guided group and the blind group. This goes to show and suggest further what we've talked about before that close enough seems to no longer apply. For steroids where you have this nuclear option, getting it medication close enough maybe helps in the short term, but the clinical outcomes really improve uh, with more accuracy uh, with the injections using ultrasound guidance. And we think this is probably more and more true as we move towards orthobiologics and other adjuncts away from the close enough strategy from steroids alone. And finally, just to kind of give a view of where the future might be going for ultrasound guidance in orthopedics and musculoskeletal pain injections and other interventional measures, I think this speaks to the future of precision medicine. This was a paper where it, from France that I loved where they did it and developed a new anatomical measure on cadavers, on doing perimeniscal injections, something that is probably not really even thought of in the landmark or blind world because of the risk of injury to cartilage structures. But by developing the technique, validating it in their cadaver, cadaver studies, and then taking it to live patients, they were able to find significant improvements in patients' pain by using this perimeniscal ultrasound guided injection that maybe will be the topic of future webinars, who knows? But before we get there, let's put out a quick poll to see we have practitioners from around the world at different states of practice. How often do you use ultrasound to guide your injections? Is it something that you're just learning today? Have you been a user, but getting used to using it? Or is it something even in your daily practice? Since it's a quick question, we'll uh, close out the poll here in a second. All right, and let's see where people are. Oh, so we have a lot of people who are just learning today. That's great. About a third there and maybe some on the daily and a large spectrum in between. Well, it's great. I think we have something to share for everyone and we can't think of anyone better to take us on this journey than Dr. Alan Hirahara, who's an orthopedic surgeon specializing in sports medicine and is board certified in orthopedic surgery and orthopedic sports medicine in the US and in Canada. He runs a busy private practice in Sacramento he was fellowship trained in orthopedic sports medicine at the University of Toronto, uh, and he completed his residency training in, 
at in Montreal and medical school in San Francisco. Dr. Hirohara lectures and teaches nationally and internationally. He does research and publishes on arthroscopic shoulder and knee surgery, orthobiologics, and the use of ultrasound. He's a team physician for the Sacramento River Cats and the California State University. And Dr. Hirohara was appointed to and currently serves on the prestigious NCAA Committee of Competitive Safeguards and Medical Aspects of Sports. Alan Hirohara, we're going to hand it over to you. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate having having me back. This has always been a lot of fun. Uh, it's going to be interesting today. We're going to talk a bit about the knee, and of course, my disclosures. And here are our objectives. But the thing I always tend to start off with is, you know, people have asked me, "Well, why ultrasound?" Because I have an MRI. I mean, what's the point? And what's really interesting, I find, is that you know, a lot of people will come up with, "Well, you have better access." you know, to ultrasound, it's quicker, it's easier, you know, it's no magnetic fields, no harmful problems to people with pacemakers or metal in their body. And it's more portable. I mean, you can take it places, you can kind of use it everywhere and you can have it available it has not this big machine. And then of course, it's not that as expensive. But to be perfectly honest, these are not reasons why I use ultrasound. This is not my thing. This is not what got me into ultrasound. What got me into ultrasound is kind of what you said earlier on biologics. Biologics is exactly why I got myself into ultrasound. I was over in Europe actually in 2007, and uh, it was amazing how I started getting interested, actually 2009, I started getting interested in biologics. And I realized talking to the Europeans, the Asians, they've been doing ultrasound for years where I had not been exposed that much to it. And it opened my eyes that, you know, doing blind injections was just not okay. And it gave us other opportunities to evaluate pathology in a different way and see different things that we should be seeing. And so it, it's interesting. And then eventually once I started using my clinic, got started using it in my surgeries. And it's really amazing how this has grown in all these 15 years of working with biologics and ultrasound. So I think the biggest thing for me was that corticosteroid risk. And in, in Oran, you kind of talked about this. It softens, weakens cartilage, weakens tendons, thins bone, increases risk of infection. The big thing for me is diminishing immune response, increasing blood sugars. But more importantly, more recently, we've been seeing it also hurts surgical outcomes. What's interesting is that there's a big negative effect. And so, you know, talking to patients and talking to primary care doctors and other surgeons, you know, too many people are too willing to just willy-nilly put cortisone into people. And this has got a problem, especially for me. Like now patients are coming to me and saying, okay, well, I have a cuff tear. Can you fix me? Oh, but I had a cortisone shot last week. Now I'm like, no, I can't. Like, because it's definitely going to impact negatively the surgical outcome. And so cortisone has risk. And so I have to really, really kind of emphasize to people, don't just archery throw something in, especially if you think you're going to send this to a surgeon where they're going to do surgery, you're going to hurt the outcome. You're going to hurt the patient. It does not do a good thing. And that's where I'm hoping at some point down the road, these primary cares, these insurance companies understand that, you know, what you're doing does impact downstream some of the things that we want to offer the patients. You know, and what's interesting with ultrasound is that it really helps us see pathology better and different. And here's an example of like using ultrasound. And I remember when I was first learning about it, one of the biggest things that I found personally with ultrasound is like, it can help, help me see the actual pathology better. You can actually see the architecture of the actual tendon. And what's really kind of critical is like the technique. And so for example, when we do an MRI, it doesn't matter what position the patient's in, doesn't matter like how you're looking at it, it's just gonna give you a good image. Ultrasound's not like that. You know, the technique of how to do it is critical. And so learning how to do it correctly was important. So when I first came back from Europe, having you know learned more about ultrasound, gosh, I had to spend a lot of time to really develop how to do it correctly. So, you know, learning from people, reading books, going to courses, you know, here's an example, like for example, on the left-hand side you see here, is this a quad tear on ultrasound? The MRI is there, so it's clearly not. Why does it look hypoechoic? Well, it turns out it's because of technique, the legs and extension. And you either can then toe in, which is the next picture here, and you can see how the, the tendon now shows up, or you can actually put the knee on a little bit of flexion and now you see the tendon really well. So knowing how to do it will show you what's going on in that specific uh, specific tendon itself. 
And so that's what's really critical here. So having the ability to see what's normal in a tendon versus fusiform swelling versus a specific hypoechoic area, which might be a partial tear, or even a full rupture. So people talk about tendinopathy as being a specific thing. It's not. It's a spectrum of disease. And understanding where you are on that spectrum and then applying the proper treatment is what's critical. So even though I got started off looking at you know, how to apply biologics, I soon learned that it opened the door to better diagnose my patients. I mean, Oran, you, you're in the ER. Do you do the same thing for this? A hundred percent. Yeah. And um, I, I think you have a good point in terms of the, you know, you need really good image quality also, because it's a pretty subtle difference to find where you are on the spectrum. And it really influences how you're going to intervene on a patient. Um, and maybe that's one of the daunting things to people. I know a third of our uh, people who are watching the audience are just learning how to do this, that that really getting access to a machine where you can see what you need to see um, can remove some of that daunting feature because it, there's a guess, there's a bit of guesswork in the beginning of, am I really seeing pathology or not? Or is it just my technique or poor technique like you were alluding to? And knowing the difference between, no, I know I'm doing this the right way. This is real pathology. Uh, that's a subtle line that does take some education to get around. Yeah. And I always tell the story how I got started is that, you know, I actually would, whenever I send my patients for MRIs and they diagnose something, I would beg the patient, please let me scan your shoulder. I'm not going to charge you, but let me scan your shoulder so I can find the pathology so I can teach myself about what it is actually there going on. And that's kind of how I really proved myself that I could see the pathology. That is really what I'm looking at and believe it. You know, people, I say, oh, go scan ultrasound, everyone, and then look at the MRI. I'm the opposite. I want to know the answer of what I'm looking for, what I should be seeing so that I can learn that pathology well. So, you know, and then taking that biologics and then applying it correctly, that's kind of like what I had to learn. Like who, as a surgeon, you know, who do I really need to take the surgery? Who do I not? This is an example of a patellar tendinopathy here on the left that is very extensive. There's a large hypochoic area. The tendon is very swollen. This is someone that honestly doesn't do very well with simple PRP injections and conservative management. You know, these people tend not to get better very well. And this is someone classically we would take to surgery and we would go in and debride the tendon, repair the tendon back down. And when we got in there, you'd think that there's a hole. There's actually not a hole. It's just very diffuse, bad tissue that needs to be kind of gotten more in order. And so what we've learned is that bone marrow concentrate for this specific pathology is actually better. But you would never know that unless you had actually done the old check because the MRI would just show this, you know, you know, area of like tendon loss and it's and it wouldn't be right. And what's interesting is that now when you can actually see it, let's get that the video to, sh to, to run, you can see how we can actually put the needle, put the bone marrow exactly where it has to go. And as a lot of people know right now, bone marrow is not covered on insurance. So these people are going to be paying cash. So you better do a really good job and make sure this works because if they're going to pay that amount of money, this better fix the problem. And you better be doing it correctly, doing it right, and making sure you have a good outcome for the patient. I know we all want a good outcome, outcome for the patient, but then why wouldn't you give the best treatment, meaning learn the ultrasound, learn the ways to do it. So here's an example of this patient, pre-injection, then four months post, and then eight months post. And you can see there's a huge difference. And this person did fabulous. They went on to full healing, back to full sports, you know, and, and that's what's really nice, being able to follow them easily. And this doesn't cost a lot of money to check them out and bring them in for a standard appointment. You know, whereas same for an MRI is going to be hundreds and sometimes thousands of dollars. So I think this really helps understand the patient better. And that brings us to our first video. And so what we did was we went into the cadaver lab and we then basically are showing you how we're doing this. So here you see me scan the quad. And I always tell people, start right above the patella and then work your way up. People tend just to slap the, the, the scanner on willy-nilly, like wherever it's going to go. No, be specific. Put them in 30 degrees of flexion, start right at the patella, and start scanning proximally. You can see the patella, I mean, see the, the quad tendon very well. And then, of course, this helps you identify where you're going to go in specifically. So then you know where you want to go. I like for these injections in plane, short axis, which is what you're seeing here. And you can see really well. You see the needle perfectly. It's and so, 
hypercoagulation. You're doing intra intratendinous injection here, right? Of yes. the quadriceps tendon. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And this is something you would never want to do with cortisone because cortisone would damage a tendon. It would do some uh, definite increase the risk of rupture. That would be totally inappropriate. But doing this, say, for biologics, now you're talking. But what's also right. nice, let's say you didn't want to go intratendinous. You wanted this person to be able to play sports this weekend. Well, in that case, maybe you'd go more peritendinous going both anterior and posterior, but then you know you did the right thing. You know you didn't hurt them. Letting them go play this weekend is okay. Whereas if you went into that tendon, you don't want them to play because you might've damaged it and it could increase the risk of rupture. Right. And it's a really thin structure there in the patellar tendon. Like you have to really, I mean, you couldn't do that blind safely. Uh, now remember, but remember this is more mid substance where it's more thinner. Mm -hmm. This, okay. right, this is patella, but if you go more proximal where most of the tendinopathy occurs right under mm -hmm. the patella, then it's a little bit thicker right there. And that's where it tends to be swollen. And also when you're doing the injection, you're doing it for tendinopathy. So it tends to be a swollen tendon typically. It's a bigger target. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. But that's, but that's also why you want to be able to see it, you know, so you can know where you're going. Yeah. All right, let's move on. So. How do I do injections? And that's always like another really big question. And if you've ever seen any of my, my videos before and any of my, my lectures, this is probably something everyone's heard before. You know, what do you need? You know, and, and what I tell people is you need what you need. So it depends on your comfort level, depends on your understanding of um, sterile technique. It also depends on how much work you're going to do. So if you can do a lot of work for a lot of stuff, you might need a sterile OR with sterile drapes and everything. Um, whereas when I'm doing a simple injection, I tend to use practically nothing. I mean, you know, I'm, I, I don't worry about sterile gel. I don't worry about the operating room or transducer sheets or drapes, uh, you know, gallon mask hats. I, I don't do any of that stuff. And the reason why is because from my point of view, I know how to do a sterile technique. I know how to sterilize the area of the skin and then never touch it with anything else but my sterile needle. And so I'm really careful not to contaminate myself ever. And if you are worried about contaminating yourself, then yes, please use whatever you need to use to do a good job. I mean, Oren, do you think that's fair? Totally fair. Yeah. I mean, I operate in a bit of a dirtier environment than maybe you do. Uh, and I, 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 we call it dirty sterile. So at least anything, you know, going through the skin, I'm comfortable is sterile, but I don't, I'm not going to sterilize the whole field for a, a quick injection. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. So here's an example of, you know, me doing an injection in my clinic. And you'll notice I'm, no, I'm not wearing gloves. And uh, in fact, he's filming me, filming me doing this. It's kind of fun. You know, he's got camera filming there. And, you know, so I use uh, iodine on the area, then uh, alcohol swab, ethyl chloride, which has been shown in studies not to contaminate the area. And then, uh, as you'll notice, I've got my hand on the patient. I've got my hand on my, on my probe. I never come down to that area where I, uh, I cleaned off ever, except for my needle. And then I'm done. I'm out. So it's, it's you know, something. and um, I, I want to point out the pro move here. It's an older device, but your technique is still stellar where I always try to teach, you know, the needle aims towards the screen, right? So this is like the most slick way to do any injection is get that screen in your line of view and you make it you, then because you make it look so easy there, just kind of dropping in and doing it for people who are just learning. They might feel like there's a bit of a struggle, but if you don't get any of your body into it, the, the, uh, the logistics of getting the needle and the ultrasound together, uh, it really simplifies it. So what you want to do is you want to have that ultrasound. So if you're doing in plane, you want it right in front of you, right in front of you and, and going right down your line of sight so that when you take your needle, you're going down, right down the line of sight. So you can't go to the mm -hmm. side. You can't go this way or over here. You're going right down the center. I see people turn it this way and then try to inject this way with, with them over here. Yeah. This is a disaster. I, I can't. Technique, yeah. Yeah, you'll never do well here. Don't do that. You know, and also I've heard people say, well, I'll put the needle in and then go find myself with my ultrasound. Don't do that either because you want to be able to identify your pathology and bring your needle to the pathology. That's really a critical teaching point that you want to learn how to do well and so that you can consistently hit your mark. Would you say that's right, Lauren? 100%, yeah. All right, knee joint injections. And I'm sure this is probably what most people want to see. So. As you all know, and Ron gave you some great articles ahead of time, you know, despite overwhelming evidence, people still 
don't believe it and I don't understand why. Um, and people are just so excellent injections and they never miss. And oh boy. Yeah. All right. Not much more I have to say about that. Moving on. Um, uh, the accuracy, as Oren said, is pretty clear. There are many studies that show that you just need to use ultrasound. And in my experience, you know, patients just have less pain because I'm no longer missing. You know, and that's the point. If you if you inject into a tendon, into a muscle, into a ligament, okay, yeah, it hurts. And I tell people flat out, if I'm going into a structure, sorry, it's going to hurt. There's nothing I can do about that. But if you're going into a space, into a sheath, into a joint, it's not going to hurt. There, there's, there's no nerve fibers. You know, there's nothing to hurt. So there should be no pain. And so if you're going into one of these struck one of these these things and it hurts, you missed. Just that's just the way it is. The knee joint. Everyone that I know, maybe it's different today, but was taught to use this arthroscopic portal to when they do their injections. We have anterior medial, anterior lateral, I don't care which, but they do one of these two spots. They go under the patella, next to the tendon, and they just aim for the center of the knee, and boom, you're there. I don't think people realize. It's not as easy as you think it is. So let me show you something. Here's an MRI. If you look at the MRI, that white spot is the joint in a non-effused knee. That's the joint. That's the spot you have to hit. Let's talk about that. So it's not going. Here we go. Let's say there is an effusion. There is your joint. Now I can see the effusion in the joint, okay? But now let's say we're going to go and we're going to hit that with, with a needle. Do you realize that Hoffa's fat pad is roughly four centimeters with the skin and the tendon and the fat in that whole area? That's four centimeters into that area. And for those Americans, non-Canadians that have, have to use inches, 1.5 inch needle, which is what we typically use, is only 3.8 centimeters. You're not going to make it into the knee joint even with an effusion. So the problem here is the knee has pretty good neurologic, uh, you know, uh, innervation. So if you miss, they're going to hurt. But if you hit the joint, it's not going to hurt. So what could you hit? Well, you could hit the skin, subcutaneous fat. You can hit Hoffa's fat pad. You can, if you miss, hit the cruciates. You could hit the condyles. You can hit the meniscus, you know. So this is really not a good spot to go for. It really isn't. This this is actually a really hard spot to hit. So I would urge you to not make this your routine place that you're going to enter to try to hit your joint. I say hit this spot. This is a super patellar lateral approach. You can do it in plane. It's super easy. Even when there is no effusion, you can still hit it reliably. A little bit harder, but you can do it. At least it's doable. And it's something that you can reliably do under old channel, under vision. So how do we do that? First thing to do, put them into 30 degrees of flexion, okay? If you put them into too much flexion, the quad tendon smashes down onto the femur, on, smashes on the fat pad, and guess what? You're gonna squeeze all the fluid out of that area, and then you're gonna be as if you had no effusion. So don't go too high of flexion. That's the first tip. Second tip, when you put the probe down, what I see a lot of new people do is they'll push down really hard. They're, they're, they're going to get a good image, push it down, because they're taught when they're imaging to push it down and compress the tissue and see better. Well, the problem is it's going to squish all the fluid away. And so now it's going to be harder for you to see. So have a lighter touch. Just leave it on top, just let it down. And then you can push, let go, push, let go, and you'll see how it kind of fill up. You can also kind of bring fluid up by pulling some of the fluid up by kind of doing that, that movement with your hand to pull the fluid up into your region. So that's the first couple tips. And if, when you get a good image, this is what you're going to see. So what you're going to see is you're going to see that quad tendon on top. You'll see that joint space effusion. You'll see the fat pad. And then you'll see the trochlear bone. And the big key here is you want that trochlear bone to pop. So you want to make it as white as possible, as hyper echoic as possible. And that's really going to help you see a lot better. Because the problem is, if you don't have it really in a hyper echoic, you're not, you're not perpendicular. You really want to be perpendicular to your structure, to your tissue, and you're going to see much better. You won't have anisotropy. You won't have all these other problems of visualization. 
So those are the key points you really want to work with. So just kind of tilt different angles and find what's most perpendicular where the bone pops the widest. That's what you're going to want to see. Then once you get it, take a look. Take a look and see how far that distance is. And so you know. And then what you can do is you can plan and say, okay, well, guess what? I now know that my entry point is one centimeter distal from my transducer. So I can come in parallel to my transducer and I know exactly where I want to come in. So those are like a really key tip so that when I come in with my needle, boom, my needle's right there. It's right in my spot. I'm right where I want to be. Piece of cake. Just makes it super easy. You don't have to go guessing around. And then the patient, because those things with patients, if you do it like this, where you just like in, in, out, they'll be like, that's it. You're done. That's all. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you should see the surprise on their face. They're like, they're blown away. And then you tell them, you show them on the screen saying, okay, see this black area? I'm going to hit this. They see the needle come in, they see it hit the black area, they see you inject it, and you're out. And they're like, yeah, you hit it. I mean, they, they completely buy in. It's amazing the patient satisfaction that they get being able to see that you did what you told them you were going to do. Do you see the same thing we're on? Oh, yeah. This And this is, um, you know, I call this the gateway drug of uh, ultrasound guided procedures, because like you said, it's one, everyone seems way overconfident in their ability to do it and tolerates pain, scraping sounds, patient discomfort. You know, they probably missed a bunch of times but didn't know. Uh, and somehow that's been normalized and yet, and then you do this and the patient, like you said, is like texting through the whole th procedure or something. They don't even know, or you can inject when there's minimal effusion, like this video is going to show, which is really hard to do blind. Um, and you know, they don't even, it's just, it's such a different world of difference. And once you see it for yourself, then you realize like, oh, I, why am I ever doing anything blind again <laughs> for on such an easy procedure? It makes such a huge difference. Now you like start stepping up the difficulty and it's like a no brainer from there. Right. And so here you are, you're looking at this going, oh, uh, where's the joint? Oh, <laughs> right. uh, what am I supposed to hit? So please realize, I think you can see my, my pointer. This is cartilage. This is not the joint. So you don't want to hit this. This would be bad. So that's not the joint. That's cartilage. That's, that's black cartilage. The joint's actually over here. Okay. So you've got your tendon up here and then your joint's actually right over here. And so the problem is we want to get up over, over the bone, angle down this way and get over here. That's where we want to be. So let's run the video. So you'll see my needle come in. And actually, I was a little bit low. Let's see, I came in a little bit low. I didn't want to hit the, I didn't want to hit the tendon. I came up over the bone. I then angled down so that I'm not going to hit the tendon. If I come this way, I would hit the tendon. I'm angling down. And I'm going to come forward into this region. And then I'm going to start to fill. And as I fill, what, it's, what you're going to notice is it's not making a bubble. If I made a bubble, I'm probably not in the joint because you shouldn't be making a bubble. Remember, the joint space is one big area and flows down. So by injecting and it not filling, you know you're in the joint because it's flowing in the joint, okay? Because it's not filling up. So that's another key point. So you guaranteed I was in the joint there. So here we go. Here's the cadaver. And uh, you can see automatically, uh, you've seen um, a bit of a spur here. There's a small, a small spur bone. This person obviously had some arthritis. And there is actually joint space over here. And here's the tendon right here. And so what's nice is that you can plan. Say, okay, well, I need to kind of enter about a centimeter, roughly. Because if I go in too high, I'm going to be up here. That'll hurt someone. Not this person, of course, but it hurt someone else. And you don't want to be too low or you're going to just run into the, to the bone. And so... See, there it is. I'm going to get right in. And you're going to see me moving around. And see, there it is. There's my needle right there, right above that little spur right there. And then I'm right here in that area. And this is actually the joint right there. And you can see me moving around, moving the, the stuff around so you can see really well. So it really helps you identify, you know, and plan. And, what, and what's, what you're seeing here is like, you'll notice like, I'm only, like I said, a centimeter down from from my uh, my probe, okay? So that way then I pre-planned. I knew exactly where I wanted to enter before I entered and I made sure I was gonna be in the right spot. I think most people probably would have started down here. I think it needed to be lower, but then you would have been down here on the condyle and hit the bone. Comments are on? Uh, no, that was great. All right, let's move on.
Yeah, and you can see that if I had done the other type of injection, it would have gone here, and that just would not have been good. Yeah. All right, now we're going to talk about Pezan's right injection. There's not much to talk about about this. The hard part about this is finding your tendons. And, you know, a lot of people teach us to look in short axis and find those tendons. I actually find that really hard to do. I actually find it easier to find the tendons in long axis because seeing the fibers of the tendons really stand out against the fat, I find to be easier to do myself. Um, so here you go. In fact, there you go. I've just found the tendon right there. And, you know, the hard part is people say just being able to see it from end to end, but that's the tendon right there. And so once I have the tendon all in line, I just come in plane and I just come in here and I'm going to bring my needle in and there's my needle right there. And I'm just going to reorient to get into the sheath. And then once I'm in the sheath, I'm going to start giving my injection. And there I am. I'm now in the sheath. Boom. And you're going to see I pulled back because I had skewered the tendon a bit. So I pulled back out of the tendon. And now you can see I'm, I'm actually injecting. And you can see it's going to flow down that sheath. Now you think, okay, well, Pazan's running the bursa. Yeah, you might want to be on top of the area to be in the bursa more, if unless you want to be in the tendon sheath, or and of course, which tendon sheath? Because there's three of them. So these are the ways you can do it. So you can go tendon sheath, you can go in the bursa, you can do each one, whatever you think clinically is most relevant for your patient. I think the problem is, is that when you're using biologics, you have to be much more point specific using a sniper rifle. It's not so much uh, a um a shotgun effect like you used to use with cortisone. We just have to get the region and you're good. So I think you need to be much more specific about what your goal is, what you're trying to, what you're trying to do. And how do you decide that? Well, it's, it's, a, it's both clinical and imaging as well. So, you know, as you know, you can sometimes see the bursitis, you can see the swelling of the bursa overlying that region. Well, then no brainer, just go get the bursa. It's easy, right? You'll see it. You'll see the swelling. Um, if you think it's just the tendons and you want to hit the tendons, well, then this is the way to do it and get into the sheath. So it just depends, again, clinically what you think the problem is. Also, you can also identify the spot sometimes because sometimes it's really point specific with this. You know, people thought in the past that it was the bursa. I think it's not always the bursa. I think sometimes it is actually the tendons. It's just like any, ten any tendon can have tendinopathy. I think these can as well. So if you find that it's one specific spot more than another, then ultrasound that area. And if you're finding a tendon right under there, well, hit that tendon. Now, surgical applications. So, sorry, I'm a surgeon. So we're going to talk a bit about surgery and how I use this in surgery. So that's kind of like, we just kind of gave some kind of general ideas about what we do with the non-surgical stuff, but like taking into surgery. For me, it, it's funny, you know, very early on, I kind of realized, I think I started doing this like 2010, 2011. I started like realizing, oh my gosh, I could do this in surgery because it would really help me. Um, being able to identify pathology and anatomy under the skin that I can't see that I have to normally cut open and try to find with a finger can be problematic or trying to find with an x-ray. Uh, so I found that actually there's a lot of surface anatomy, especially bony surface anatomy or tennis surface anatomy or ligamentous surface anatomy that I can use to be able to help do a better job surgically in real time. And obviously I can't bring an MRI into, you know, the surgery center with me and fluoroscopy is just an x-ray. It doesn't show soft tissue well. So I found this to be something that really helped quite a bit. And so whether I use an in-plane uh, out of plane or the crosshair marking method to identify my anatomy of where I want to get to. Um, you know, it's really whatever works best in the person's hands. I've published now several articles on interventional procedural uses with Alberto Pinero. Um, I've published several articles on different techniques of either repair, or reconstruction of various structures in the body, anterolateral ligament, MPFL, MCL. Uh, and also the tinnitus of the biceps brachii, which we talked about on the last video. Um, and, you know, it just really does help me do a better job for my patients where we can, using this high frequency scanner, identify anatomy so that I'm not guessing. And people think that surgeons are really good at knowing every bit of anatomy. It can be hard sometimes, like you're in there and you're trying to find out and touch where the tubercle is or where this epicondyle is. 
And it's not always as obvious as you think it is. Um, whereas when you see the bony protuberance, it's like, oh, well, it's right there. You know, it makes it so much easier. And so this is something that I use quite a bit. This uh, this new high def scanner uh, has just been fantastic. The issue for me is the wireless. The fact that I can just drop it in a bag, into a sterile bag and use it surgically and having the buttons to control uh, the iPad from afar um, and then having my iPad anywhere in the OR, it's been great. It just helps so much. It preserves sterility. Uh, it's simple. It's easy. It's functional. And the quality is off the charts for what I need. It's funny, Warren, you talked about this earlier, how, you know, when we started doing this, you know, 15 plus years ago, the you, you like you're studying you know grayscale you're studying you know snowflakes and you're like uh what am i really seeing it, it was hard but now with the quality of the image it's it's nuts yeah and it really uh, you know i found since i started however maybe it was similar timing uh, at least over 10 years of like it, it, you you don't guess your technique anymore it is easy when you're especially when you're looking at subtle pathology you're wondering is it just my scanning technique or is this real pathology uh with the more subtle findings and then as the image resolution has gotten better and better it's easier to you know maybe our technique has also gotten better over the years but we're kind of more confident in the image like no that's a real pathology you know and, and once you feel confident then you can really see it yeah so let's talk a bit about how to do the mpfl so how do we actually do it well, what I do is on the MPFL, you can see here, the MPFL is right there. And what we're looking for is the adductor tubercle, which is now is right there. And we know that the MPFL on the femoral side is hard to find. And they have to typically use a guide with a fluoroscopy to try to identify this location, which is actually pretty hard and is pretty easy to miss. Whereas on ultrasound, it's really easy to see. So all we have to do is find the adductor tubercle I come slightly proximal. And um, at that point, um, it, it's just some, I'm sorry, I come slightly distal and then slightly anterior. And it's just right there. It, it's just simple. There's a small little triangle region where you find it. And then I just put a needle on it. So what I do is I come in with my needle. And then once I put my needle on my spot of where I want to be, uh, basically I just do a cut down. I just do a small little incision. Um, I replace the needle with my trocar. I put my guide into place at the exact spot I want to be anatomically, drill my hole, put my anchor in place, and then simply just suture down the ligament back in place where it's been torn. And so this is for obviously patellar dislocations. When you have a specific tear, it can tear off the, pat the patellar side, it can tear off the femoral side, and it can even tear mid-substance. But the most common really is off the femoral side or the patellar side. And so it's easy to do these repairs. So I don't have to do reconstructions. And so this has just been a simple, simple technique and easy to do. So I really like this. And this is something you can do anywhere in the body. So if you're trying to find a specific anatomical location, put a needle on it. You got it. You're done. Thanks. So at this point in summary, you know, ultrasound's a tool. It's like fluoroscopy, it's like arthroscopy, it's inexpensive, widely available, allows for visualization, helps guide injections and surgeries. And at this point, it transforms surgeries from open to percutaneous. But as I said, from my point of view, the, the, the big difference for me is it allows me to be point specific in the, in the uh, delivery of biologics. And I think that's really made a big difference for my patients. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Dr. Hirahara. Uh, there's a lot of great questions coming in and we're gonna get to those very shortly. So please keep using the Q&A. Um, before we get it there, we're gonna hand it over to Shelly for uh, a brief demo. Thank you. Great imaging, Dr. Hirahara, as always. Um, I have a model here that I am just going to um, be showing. Obviously, I'm not gonna be injecting today, but uh, I'll show you just a little bit of the scanning technique and how to just optimize your imaging for when you wanna do this. I'm gonna just start with his knee um, totally extended here, just to show you um, a little bit of the um, artifact that Dr. Hirahara was talking about earlier. Now I'm using the L15 scanner, um, as we've seen, and I'm using the knee preset here. Just gonna unfreeze my image, great. Okay, so just starting on the patella here, which is this bright white bone. And right off the bat, I can see the quad tendon, but this is the artifact that Dr. Hirohar was talking about earlier, the anisotropy. So because we're not perpendicular to the tendon, we're just getting some drop out there that could easily be mistaken for pathology. 
So if I have my pa patient just bend his knee, I'm gonna get you to flex it quite a bit there. Great, and now we're getting beautiful detail. We're seeing really nice um, insertion here of the tendon. And if I just go right over the uh, patella here, we're seeing a little bit of uh, enthesophyte here, probably from some previous injury. And now if I go more proximally on the tendon, you saw a little bit of pathology earlier as well. So right here, we've got at least one loose body. <laughs> Within the fat pad, would you say, Dr. Hirahara? Uh, I think you see both. Actually, there's two. There's one there. Oh, yeah. There's one there, there too. Yeah. You've got, you got the perfect image. Yeah. And yeah. that definitely looks like it's uh, intraarticular fat pad, uh, is my guess, from probably arthritic changes, is my guess. Okay. All right. Now, is this something you could treat, or is this. Um... Surgically, we go in and just take them out. If, if, okay. if they're symptomatic, if they were migrating around, if they're just there and they don't bother him and he's never known about it, I completely ignore them. Okay. All right. Um, so this is cartilage on the distal femur, not to be mistaken um, for fluid. I'm going to rotate my scanner 90 degrees and, and I will start right at the patella, like as you suggested, and we'll start to scan up. Now I am seeing uh, the quad tendon here, but I'm just going to get the patient's leg straightened a little bit to about 30 degrees where we're gonna actually be able to see more of the joint. So the tendon is here, and now we're actually seeing the joint space here, whereas I wasn't seeing that before. Yeah, that's a the fabulous example of what we were talking about before, how yeah. by flexion, it squeezes the fluid out, but he clearly has an effusion. You can see it right yeah. there. It's not big, but it's there. And yeah. by bringing that leg out to a little bit more extension, and I use a bolster, uh, you can really start seeing the joint space easier. A little bit more. Yeah, I can't believe what a difference that makes. It's, it's quite night and day. And and the other thing too, like you mentioned, is 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 pressing. Um, like as an ultrasound tech, uh, like you said, I mean, if I can't see something, my go to is to press harder, and uh, and I can actually squash that fluid out of the way. I I do see the tendon a little bit nicer, but I lose that um, the nice visualization of the joint. The other right thing you're here. Doing right there, Shelly, which is a really great thing, is you're showing people what they can do quickly to help identify what's tendon and what's what's fat and where the joint is. So by right. so, you really identified that that linear differential between um, fat pad and tendon, which is going to be joint. Right. Okay. Great. Okay. Let's put that leg down, and I'll get the other one up just a touch. Now I'm just going to just give a quick demo of the Pez. Here. So I'd like to start at the medial meniscus, which is which is this triangular structure right here. And now I'm just going to scan inferiorly down the tibia. And there we're starting to see the tendons there. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to decrease my depth a little bit here as well. Great. And so if we're... And the problem is you're, you're really good at what you're doing, Shelly, and you're, you're, you're <laughs> super easy, but what's, what she's doing, which is actually difficult technique is that she found tendon in her image, kept that part of her scanner solid and then rotated the other end so that she brought the entire tendon in frame. Right. And yeah. that's not obvious, but you did it like without even thinking, <laughs> that's, a, that's a, that's the technique you've got to learn how to do. Well, and, and in all honesty, this is um, the first time that I've ever um, found this structure. So <laughs> it's not that difficult as long as you kind of understand how ultrasound works, you know, a little understanding about it. And uh, and just, I mean, you all as practitioners know the anatomy uh, much better than I do. So, you know, you know where to place your scanner. It's just a matter of optimizing that image um, just to make it a little bit prettier. <laughs> no, that looks fantastic. Excellent. Great. Thanks so much for the demo there, Shelly. Uh, no we have problem. a lot of questions and uh, we want to make sure we get to them. Um, we're going to hand it over here to Janez for a minute and please keep using the Q&A and uh, we'll have plenty of time to get to a lot of these questions in just a moment. Yes, our Q&A session is starting very soon. Just a quick moment first. 
to thank Oran and Dr. Hirohara and Shelly for fabulous live scanning. Before we open up the floor to live questions, here's a quick poll for you, actually. We'd love to help everyone continue their journey in bringing ultrasound guidance to their practice. So please complete this poll. Uh, to let us know if you would like to be provided with further information and you can click on as many options as apply. So you may opt to ask for pricing and availability uh, for your region. You can ask to speak to one of our experts about the advantages of wireless ultrasound for your practice. If you'd like to discuss scanner features, please select that option. You can also book a one-on-one -on -one virtual demo with one of our experts to see the new Claris HD3 in action in a highly interactive one-on-one -on -one session. And you can uh, ask for more video tutorials um, that we can send to you. So please go ahead and select as many options as you wish while you complete this live poll. I'll take you in a minute to introduce you to Claris HD3, the world's only third generation line of portable ultrasound scanners. Now 30% smaller, lighter, and more affordable, Claris HD3 delivers best-in-class wireless ultrasound for pain management with an easy-to-use app powered by artificial intelligence and connected to the cloud. Our Claris linear scanners are specifically designed to effectively guide pain injections with superior MSK and needle imaging. They deliver several advantages. Claris is unrivaled for near field and high resolution imaging in a handheld device. As you saw today, you get clear views of nerves, vascular structures, and other anatomy, and your needle for safe ultrasound guided injections. The secret lies in each scanner with eight beam formers. 192 elements and artificial intelligence that together deliver the image quality only found in compact systems that are more expensive and complex, but at a fraction of the cost representing 85% savings. And with AI replacing complex knobs and buttons, it's as easy to use as your smartphone. Claris is also wireless, freeing up space with zero footprint for ultra portability in a variety of settings. You get free movement with no wires getting in the way and touching your sterile prep area. And with no wires, Claris is also so much faster to clean and disinfect or fully encase in a sterile bag. Only Claris delivers linear wireless scanners with an ecosystem that includes free app for your iOS or Android devices for unlimited users. Available with our new membership, Claris Cloud, is used to easily capture and manage unlimited exams from anywhere. And your membership also includes Claris classroom videos with experts like Dr. Hirohara and onboarding with a Claris clinician to build your ultrasound skills. And Claris Live delivers one-click telemedicine if you'd like to share live scanning with a colleague for a second opinion. We'll now close off the poll in three, two, one. Thank you. If you ask for more information, we will get back to you in the coming week. One more poll. We'd like to invite you to pre-register for our next webinar in our cadaver series with Dr. Hirohara entitled Expert Ultrasound Guidance for Accurate MSK Injections and Interventions, Part 3, The Achilles. Please complete this poll to pre-register for our March webinar and we'll send you a confirmation email in the coming days. I'll give you two more seconds to save your seat. Two, one, thank you. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Hirohara and Dr. Frankel to answer your questions. Please use the questions icon in the menu bar to ask your questions of our great clinicians. Dr. Frankel, I'll invite you to moderate. Great, yeah, okay. So, so many questions. Let's try and bang out as many as we can here, Ellen. Um, one always comes up. You mentioned about uh, your approach to pathology and trying to use kind of gold standards on patients, You know, getting their MRIs and then comparing your findings with theirs. Uh, are there any other libraries or places you know where people can learn um, good MSK pathology? And then how about learning the actual hands-on needle guidance before they kind of jump in on live patients? Yeah, great questions. Um, number one, in terms of pathology, admittedly, there's a ton of books out there. I don't find them all that great, to be honest with you. Um, I've not found like the ideal book. I know there's more and more coming out. There's, in the recent years, more that have been released, which I think are a benefit. Um, overall, I personally find experience is the best teacher. And so getting like every patient that you see, because I'm sure a lot of you are busy, get your MRIs. And then when you see them, scan everyone. Uh, it just, it, you're going to get good really fast. It doesn't take that much to be honest with you. Um, so I'm a big fan of that. Uh, and of course, you can go to, go to courses and learn too. Um, in terms of the best way to learn, uh, using 
basically just basic skills. Uh, get 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 in get in old shell machine, and you can get like you know a Jello cup, and learn how to just nail the the pineapple in the Jello cup. And mm-hmm. I mean, people laugh at me, but it's the cheapest, easiest way to do it. I could tell you go get a cadaver lab, you know, but Jello cups work really well. I mean, we ran a we ran a uh, um, an ultrasound course years ago, and we just bought Jello cups, and people just love them because they're cheap and easy. Because those mm-hmm. fans thousand bucks yeah phantoms are expensive we've used like tofu and other stuff also just to practice your needling yeah actually i think i was in hong kong and we actually had uh like we i think we got like pig's feet you know yeah and that worked really well too yeah i've done a lot of courses where we used you know yeah bought different cuts of meat and then you mm-hmm. just like kind of practice in the cuts of meat <laughs> yeah i mean Pretty seriously good. you just yeah. just just gotta just go and play with it and the key the key thing is as long as you can like image and then reliably get your needle to hit the spot you want to hit that's all you need to do because then once you learn how to scan if you can bring your needle to any point that you scanned you, you're going to be able to do what you want to do uh People have a lot of questions around biologics. Um, I'm not sure how to summarize them in a couple basic questions. I don't know. Maybe you could give just kind of a brief, like, how do you learn about integrating biologics into your practice? Uh, and and where do you learn? It sounds like there's kind of a wide world out yeah. there. And um, how do you choose what for which condition? And how do you inject it where, et cetera? Well, that's a huge lecture by itself. <laughs> yeah. And- yeah. I, I agree given, by itself. I've literally yeah. given two day courses on that alone, just that one topic. And I'm not mm-hmm. joking. It was a two day course. Um, so I would say go look at some of my other videos. You guys can go to my website, herohrmd.com. And a lot of my videos I've done in the past are still on there. A lot of the more recent ones are not on there. I admit I've not been as good about videoing them and putting them on there. But the the, the basic answer is it's all about basic science. It's all about what is the body doing? How does the body heal? What are the components of the blood, the growth factors, the stem cells? What what does everything do? Once you learn what everything does and how it works together, and, and, and please, we don't know everything. I don't know everything, but we do have a pretty good idea about the components that do their basic function and job. Not every single growth factor, but a lot of it. So learning those things about how, for example, things work. People ask the question. I, th- I saw one of the one of the questions was, how, why would PRP not work for that issue? Why was that bone marrow? Yes, mm-hmm. PRP does work for smaller lesions because remember what PRP is? It's platelets and growth factors. So platelets are the first building bark. It's the first step in the healing process. They are signalers to signal the growth factors to function. The alpha granules make stem cells migrate. Basically, the stem cells is going to either transform or be a signaler to a messenger for it to work. That's, of course, controversial currently in today's world. Not sure how they work. But the point is, if it's too big of an area and not vascular enough, PRP is not going to be good enough. That's why you need to go to something more elaborate like a bone, bone marrow. And even then, sometimes bone marrow won't be enough and you need to do a surgical procedure to stabilize because it's not all about biology. It's also about stability the mechanical stability of the environment. Did you stabilize enough so it won't keep pulling apart and then not allowed to heal? That's why the concept of casting worked for broken bones and tissues. As you can tell, this is a big topic. It's not something to be answered in two seconds. Or on, you may want to just run a biologics course, one of these webinars. Yeah, maybe if Clarence is interested in that. I mean, you guys you guys talk about enough biologics. We can take that offline. Exactly. <laughs> Um, how often do you use the ultrasound diagnostically? People want to know in terms of, you know, partial tendon tears, meniscal tears, things um, that maybe you can see in the office and maybe in places in the world where MRIs are not so available or easy yeah, to get as yeah. say like Sacramento. Yeah, exactly. Because we're, we're, we're backwards. Absolutely. Of course. Um, compared to Vancouver. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> the bottom line is, you know, ultrasound is really good for certain things. MRI is better for certain things. So definitely it's learning what's better for what and in what way. So like if I have a patellar tendinopathy, uh, a quad tendinopathy, Achilles tendinopathy, tendinopathy is just not visualized well, in my opinion, on MRI. It's not that good. Full rupture, MRI does great, especially for deeper structures. But if it's a superficial structure, 
ultrasound is just as good. And then, of course, what level of detail do you need? Are you looking for very subtle findings, tiny changes? You're right. You need a very refined, high, high level scanner that might need to be much more expensive. But if you're just trying to like hit your spot, see good imaging, good general stuff, you're right. You know, less expensive uh, uh, machines work just fine. And so it comes down to what is your goal? Admittedly, I have, I think, like six or seven scanners in my office and they're different companies and they're different kinds and they do different things. And so, you know, every everything has a purpose. You don't just have one screwdriver to do an entire job. Um, this is an American question. I'm just kind of curious to hear uh, your answer. How do you change your approach when the BMI is 50? <laughs> yeah. Spinal needle? Yeah, that's that's a that's a great <laughs> question. So obviously you are limited in your depth of your uh <laughs> your scanner and you might need a curvilinear. So that's one answer is that you might use a curvilinear. Number two, you might need a longer needle. And number three, maybe you just can't get the job done and <laughs> that you might need to go to some other alternative. Um yeah, that's like where maybe you need fluoro, right? Or something like that. I know, you know, for our you do what you can do. Yeah, right. right. Uh, let's see. Um, do you ever do nerve blocks? Or do you kind of leave that to your anesthesiologist? Them and I've taught them, but I don't do them routinely in my practice. Um, I'm not as good as I'm sure all these anesthesiologists who are phenomenal at them are. I, I would defer yeah. to them. Yeah, mm -hmm. we did a webinar um, with genicular nerves a while ago. Genicular nerve blocks. It was very interesting. Um, people are surprised that you're injecting into the tendon. Yeah, yep. Is that yeah. something like you routinely do? Uh, nope. you, you wanna say anything about it more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, it's a biologics issue. If you're doing cortisone, you'll never inject into a tendon, ever, 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 ever. But if you're using biologics, we're using either PRP or BMAC, you know, going into a tendon is totally appropriate because now obviously if you do that, it changes the recovery process, the rehabilitation, the physical therapy you're gonna recommend. So it's not going to be the same recovery method. And I've said this over and over, like if you're going to go in the tendon, don't let them like go running that weekend. You know, you don't want to have them cause more harm and damage. But yes, PRP, BMAC into a tendon is appropriate and can actually uh, kind of speed along the process. And I saw another question about Prolo, which I'm not a fan of. I don't like Prolo. I'm not a big fan of that at all. I don't agree with it. Um... I know that it has been shown in some studies to be effective. And I do think that sclerosing something, you know, can be something that can aid in the kind of inflammatory process to cause healing to occur. I'm taking this from a different point of view. I actually use leukocyte poor PRP, leukocyte poor BMAC. I'm not a leukocyte uh, rich um, fan. And so I'm not trying to cause inflammatory response, especially surgically, because I found that surgically, if you use leukocyte rich, you cause a zone of weakness and increase the risk of re rupture and re-tear. So you have to be very careful if you're going to lose leukocyte rich. And then, of course, I saw another question asking about why PRP wouldn't work for that specific thing. PRP is limited in its scope. And so you have to use smaller lesions. And we looked at it and we found that 0.48 centimeters squared lesions of tendinopathy did very poorly with PRP. And so if you have a smaller lesion, PRP is fabulous. Bigger lesion, not so good. Yeah, and that was a real wake-up call. I remember you talking about um, steroids in the shoulder. It's like, I feel like the, you have to think about the downstream consequences. I feel like people will get injections and they go, oh, it's not working. Now I need surgery. And you're like, well, actually, you got messed up. You know, there is no surgery now. Or it has to really be delayed because mm -hmm. kind of ruined, ruined the field. Yeah, it's downstream. temporal. It's clearly a temporal relationship. And so at this point, if someone gets a cortisone shot, I'd like to hold off about six months to, from surgery if possible. Okay. Some people will just yell at me and I'm like, okay, but you're taking the risk. You know, if that's really what right. you want and the right. risk complications. Do the, do the orthobiologics carry the same kind of perioperative risk? No, absolutely not. No, the only risk it's going to carry is if you use leukocyte rich PRP or BMAC during the procedure, you're risking the re-rupture of the tissue or the, or the pulling out of your, uh, of your tissue from your high tensile strength sutures. Because of the inflammatory response. Correct. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. Uh, final question in our last minute. Do you have any experience with shockwave? 
Zero. Although my good friend yeah. Daniel Moya from Argentina swears by it and thinks it's fantastic. Um, he's one of the experts in the world that's done a lot of the research and he, he, he really has done some great research. So I, I really urge you do a PubMed search look for Daniel Moya. Daniel Moya. Okay, great. Shout out to Daniel Moya. Great. All right. Well, we are at the top of the hour. Um, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Hirahara. Inez, you want to close this out? Yes. Thanks for all of you for joining us and staying till the end. Thank you also for all of your questions. We've had dozens. If we didn't get to your question, we'll follow up with you by email in the coming week. You will all receive a PDF copy of the slides and a recording of the webinar as well. So keep an eye on your inbox that will uh, be sent to you in the coming days. I'd like to close out by thanking Dr. Hirahara for sharing all of his best practices and a very big thank you to all of you for joining us. We hope to see you again for our next webinar with Dr. Hirahara on expert ultrasound guidance for accurate MSK injections in March with a focus on the Achilles. In the meantime, have a wonderful rest of your day and keep scanning. Thank you. Keep scanning. Thanks everyone. everyone.